Hello and welcome to Truth Expose TV. I'm Alden Altena, your host, and it's with great pleasure that I introduce our guest today, who's an author called Kai Cheng, and he has written a book called Total Me, Discover Contentment and Stability in 60 Minutes. Now, Kai has had chronic fatigue and chronic burnout for 13 years, up until the end of 2015. Strategies he's going to be sharing with us today has slowly built his life and helped many people in his life since then. Hello and welcome, Kai. Hi, how are you going, Aldwin? Very good, thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I'm fascinated about this topic because I know a lot of people do have a lot of hardships in their life and often don't know how to deal with that. So can you tell us a bit about your story, about how you came to actually have uh, chronic fatigue Burnout. Well, yeah, I, I, I contracted chronic fatigue in about 2003. Um, I had uh, glandular fever, uh, which commonly converts to chronic fatigue. I struggled with it for uh, 13 years, basically. Um, and by the end of 2015, uh, just because of my circumstances, the chronic fatigue was spiked, can do. And uh, I've also contracted kind of chronic burnout. So, um, yes, yeah, so I was just that much that I could do, you know. So basically, I, I, all I could do is compensate, really. Okay, and so what actually caused the chronic fatigue? Was it the stress of life? Was it the trigger points that, that, that was it gradually build, or did it just something that you? Well, I think the chronic fatigue was there, and the chronic fatigue will. Um, it will spike up and down. Uh, the more stressful, physical and, and mental stress you're under, uh, the worse the chronic chronic fatigue will, will affect you. Um, and in 2015, it was a very, very stressful year for me. And um, I think by the end of the year, it had just had spiked and, it, and burnout had, had come in. And, it um, and that's really just what happened. That's what caused it, I suppose. Years and years of stress um, that have that really culminated in this, this, this major spike in 2015. Um, and I think that's really what it was. So the stress led to it. So was this stress in your work life, in your personal life? Um, would you like to elaborate on that? Where that stress came from? Yeah, it was more in my work life. Um, everything just kind of fell apart in, you know, in our business. Uh, nothing was really progressing in 2015. Whatever I tried seemed to, in a sense, fail. And nothing, nothing really came off as close as I came. Um, you know, I was almost in the door, and then it was something that seemed shut. Um, it happened on a number of occasions, it was frustrating. Um, and, um, and, and I think it was just the frustration, trying as hard as you can, in a sense, beating your head against the wall. Not getting any significant joy from it, um, and I think that's what really resulted in in, in this, this, you know, this real spike and this real chronic you know, uh, this chronic spike and this burnout, and it, and it was just it was intolerable. I just I really was. There's nothing I could do. I could not do it. Now, physically and mentally, I was just absolutely nothing I could really do. So uh, what I did is I spent the next six months convalescing. Um, there's nothing I could do, and I suppose when you convalesce, you've got nothing to think about, no real responsibilities, no real commitments, I suppose you can sit back and think, um, and that's what I did really. Wow. And uh, so with the chronic fatigue, and the burnout, what does that look like? Does that mean you're kind of sleeping in the morning, or hard to get out of bed? What are the symptoms of that? Uh, yes, physical pain. Uh, uh, symptoms very similar to, let's say, a well, kind of extreme flu, a joint pain, uh, headaches, severe, quite severe headaches, um, lethargism, uh, what else? Um, problems sleeping, um, doing it at night, and then, you know, kind of wanting to sleep during the day, um, and demotivation, and you just feel. All the really what you feel is like you're operating at kind of 10%, 10 to 20%. Mm. You, can't, 
carrying around this 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 this, this, this really bad flu all the time, um, and you can't you can't do anything really any physical stuff. You can't play any sport. Uh, there's nothing you can really do. Um, you can't when it's when it spikes. You can't really get involved with anything that's stressful because it will make the whole thing worse. Um, and so these things. His mental, his fatigue, his mental and physical fatigue just gets worse to try and do anything. Um, so what I decided to do uh, at the end of 2015 and even into 2016 is to do nothing, is to just focus on my health because I, I, I wasn't able to do anything. Um, and that's what I did and I just focused on my health and, uh, and I thought, well, what happens after it's happened? But not much I can do at the moment anyway. That's wow. It's pretty intense, and uh, I'd say a lot of people do suffer from this. Do you think you know, you're brought up in South Africa for those watching that might hear a little bit of an accent there? And South Africa has a very high crime rate. Would you say that part of that stress was built up from part of the trauma you suffered or some of the hardship you saw growing up in South Africa? Uh, no, I don't think so because I contracted chronic fatigue. Oh, it was about six years after I have migrated to, uh, to Melbourne in Australia. Uh, so I don't really think so. Um, I think it was really brought on by the glands in the fever that, uh, that similar symptoms to flu. So you, that, that you can't really separate them or identify them when you, when you get it. And, and because I was living a very stressful life generally, um, you know, I was in business and I was in, in, involved with a lot, lot, a lot, of, a lot of big that are the property development projects with a lot of money and very ambitious and very money focused. Um, I think that ultimately the stress caught up with me um, and it just stuck with me. And, and I managed from 2003 to 2015, but I couldn't really do much physical stuff at all. And, and I, had to, yeah, I had to rest a lot more. So, but I managed and um, built up quite a significant business in Melbourne. Um, but when the GFC arrived and really took kind of to traction in 2009, it all changed. So I, I moved up to the Gold Coast and I thought I'd start over. Um, the, the financial environment was completely different for a property developer. Um, funding was really difficult to come by. And, um, and I thought I just needed to change. I got out of it. I got out of there. Um, and, and in a sense, started a new life on the Gold Coast. Fantastic. And what was that, that process to recover? You said you focused on your health. Um, so that focus, that, uh, focus on the health is obviously very important. Uh, how did you then find coping strategies or ways to actually move through the chronic fatigue and burnout? Well, I accepted, first of all, what I did, Baldwin, is I accepted that there was nothing I could do. Um, and I had suffered from this for so long. And I've finally come to this decision. I think the property, all the property development stuff and all the stress resulting from it uh, led me to believe that in a, this is after, I, you know, after the end of 2015, I started to believe that this is not going to happen. This is not, this is not the direction I should take with, you know, in my life anymore. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just rest and, and, and I'm not going to worry about the future. I'm not going to worry about the present. I'm going to just rest and focus on my health. And, and when you do that, and I think this is a lot of people with chronic fatigue, I think mean, it's a very good approach. Unfortunately, um, it's an approach where you have to really, in a sense, distance yourself from virtually everything in your life. Um, you, you, live, you live almost a reclusive life. Uh, so that's what I did. And, and I didn't worry about anything. And even from day to day, and not thinking about the future, not thinking about the past, not thinking about anything, just day to day, whatever I want to do, I do. And I'd read, and I'd watch movies, and whatever, TV, um, and, and just whatever. And then gradually over that, that, that well, early to mid, by mid 2016, I fully recovered. Um, and what I had done during that, 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 that six months, somewhere during that six months, what I started to do is I started to introspect. And I started to look at my at, at myself and my life and my past, and and and, and I recognised which I'd run before, is that there was I had some shortcomings in myself, 
that I wanted to, that I tried to fix over a period of seven years that I hadn't quite made progress with. I tried to fix certain things. And what I decided to do is instead of trying to fix certain things, I'd look at myself as a whole. And that's what my, my book is based on, is looking at ourselves as a whole, not just parts of ourselves. So I really, in a sense, started to hit the reset button in a way and decided to, okay, I'm going to look at myself as a whole. I'm going to come up with a, a, a limited number of principles by which I'll live and that will become my within. And I'd live life from within and I'd go out into the world and try and make, for myself and others, um, try, and make my, try and make the world better in a sense. Um, the world better, or my own life better, I could have a positive impact on others, uh, which was definitely not the way it was in the past. In the past, I'd been quite an aggressive, arrogant business person. So that's what I decided to do. But I made a real mission of it. Um, and I started to write notes. And uh, over, despite over many, many years, I'd studied uh, Eastern philosophy, got, uh, Taoism, Zen, Buddhism, Confucianism, everything I'd studied. But I just, I just I didn't put it into practice. So I had all this knowledge. Uh, so what I did is I drew on this knowledge and I created these 10 principles and, and, and I decided and I became formal with it. I made notes and I wrote and eventually I'll end up with a book. Um, and that's what, what happened and um, I circulated the book. And I got a very good feedback on this manuscript I still circulated. And I got very good feedback so I decided to publish it. That's awesome. And can we run through some of those principles, please? Sorry, can you say that again? Uh, can we run through uh, some of the principles, please? So some of those are the ten principles in the book. Nine that merge. Yes, sure. One. So, yes, yeah, sure. I'll go through them. I'll yeah. go through them very briefly. Yeah. Um, I think the first thing I've, that, by way of introduction, I'd like to say is that people talk about the world. But really, the world is, is a remote, for, for us as people, for you and I are old when it's, it's a remote thing. It's geographic, it's political, it's, it is environmental, it is whatever. It's just not, what, is, what the real world is, is our world. What's happening in our lives and what's happening to us on an everyday basis. Our possessions, our aspirations, our associations and the things that we do involved in. That is really our world. So there's the world and our world. And the important thing is that we spend 24 hours of every day with ourselves. So it's our relationship with ourselves that's the most important relationship. Um, and having the best world we can. So we have, everybody, each one of us has our own reality, our own world, and our own truth. We're all different, basically. Um, and I think ultimately what we really want is we, we want to live lives of contentment and stability um, and and not have that, and, 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 so that we can manage the ups and downs of life and and live peaceful and calm alive. Mm-hmm. Not saying that we, we shouldn't we shouldn't aspire to anything, but this is what we do. We live more peaceful lives basically. And but what we do is we have a limited set of principles, nine principles, that unite and amalgamate to become the tenth principle our inner home. Um, and we live from within. So we live from within and we look outwards and we, and we live life on our own terms, we determine our lives and take care of our life and our destiny. So that's by way of introduction. So the first principle is is abundance. And abundance is unlimited availability of money. So there's an abundance of food, water, spirituality, self-confidence, love, um, money, wealth, whatever you want. There, there is abundance, is there. It's, it, it's not like it's not there. Other people can have it, you can have it too. But a lot of people don't recognize that other people can have something that they can't have it. It is that, that we are all born with the same entitlement to abundance. No person is more entitled to abundance than another person. Generally speaking, some people are born into great wealth and different maybe. Um, but generally speaking, we're born with the same amount of abundance available to us, but we need to recognize this. This is where we start, that we can have. We can have what we want, and it is available. But it's only available on a certain basis. It's only available when we put effort into it. It's effort that links 
us to abundance, basically. Without effort, there will be no, we won't have, we won't gain the benefits of abundance. So that's really what, what the first, the first chapter is about briefly, um, is that effort will link you to abundance, which you are entitled to. Nobody is more entitled to abundance than you are. It's, it is an equal amount of abundance for all of us, and we're born in it. Okay. So that's the first chapter. The second chapter is about thought. Now, what we have, what what happens is this: is that a thought that takes just one minute can determine our destinies for a minute or an entire lifetime. Thoughts. This is what happens with our thoughts, basically. And where do our thoughts come from? Our thoughts come from our experiences. So we program so that all our experiences are stored in our subconscious. It comes to a conscious gateway and is stored in our, con in our subconscious. Now, 90% of what we think and what we do is, is decided by or comes from or originates from our subconscious. That's what happens, basically. So what we're really doing, in a sense, is living in the past. We're living in all these living we're living through we're living through all these past experiences and our subconscious is not discerning it lets in and out it, it, it takes whatever the, our conscious gateway allows in our subconscious will be stored in our subconscious and then what happens is when something happens to us or we, we need to respond to something um it's really our subconscious so, so our sub, we, nine, over 90 percent of what we do and what we say and what we decide to do and our actions we take originate from our subconscious mm -hmm. and and so so this is what happens and and, and and we're not aware of it most of the time we go about life and we just do things intuitively and instinctively because it's ingrained in our subconscious but unfortunately some of those it's called them subconscious thoughts that are programmed in there or stored in there are not so good um so the idea is this, is that, is, the question is this, is okay, so how do I change my subconscious? I'm, I'm, I wonder, what do I want to do, what do I do to change my subconscious? So that's ultimately the question. So the answer is this, is that we've got to generally put ourselves in a positive place, in the face of optimism. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is that we've got to watch our conscious gateway. We really need to be conscious of what we're thinking and what's coming in and what's going out. And really be because what we really do is we just respond we don't think about really think about it we're involved in discussion and engaged in any activity we don't really think about it much unless it requires much thought um it just comes out spontaneously and intuitively so we, if we want to change our subconscious we need to be wary of what we are thinking and make an effort a conscious effort to change those thoughts especially those negative thoughts but Generally, we should put ourselves in a positive place. And if we're in a positive place, then generally our subconscious will deliver positive, positive thoughts, basically. So we should never finish a negative thought. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the next, uh, briefly, the next uh, uh, chapter, which is vibrations. Um, we all, and a lot of you all know about karma, you know about karma and the law of attraction. Yeah. What happens to all of us is, knowingly and unknowingly, intentionally and unintentionally, we emit vibrations into the universe. And these vibrations mirror back at us what we're emitting out. So if we're emitting resentment, anger, hatred, this is what's going to mirror back at us. This is the vibe we're going to put out and the aura we're going to have. And people protect this aura. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you've found that yourself. You, find, you come across a person you feel, Oh, this person's a bit distant, or they're a bit, they, they're a bit um, hostile, or aggressive, or something like that. So you pick these things up. So we've got to be wary of of what we're thinking, because what we're thinking will result in these vibrations, and these vibrations will attract good and bad things into our lives. And what we're doing at the moment, the way we're living at the moment, is we're not really wary, because we're not that wary of our thoughts. We just go along. Because and continue with our conditioning we're not really wary of it we're not really wary of our of the karma we're putting out and the aura we're putting out so we can we can attract good things into our lives we can detract or 
take force things out of our lives, basically. Um, that we would rather not into our lives. So, so what happens is a thought, when we think something, it becomes a vibration, and that determines our destiny, basically. That's what happens to us. Um, we put out these vibrations, you feel the vibration from a person, you've got these negative vibrations happening, or these aggressive, whatever now, vibrations happening, and people respond to you in kind. That's what will happen. But um, the alternative, and in the opposite, if you're putting out vibrations of comfort, welcoming vibrations, um, well, uh, vibrations of caring, of sincerity, of, of, of honesty, then this is what will mirror back at you. So that's what basically happens. So that's, a, that's the chapter on vibration. Then we move on to the next chapter, which is individuality. Now we talk about, yeah, we talk about us as individuals, as people, as, as individual people. Now we're all unique creations of the universe, um, and we're meant to be different. None of us is the same. We're all unique creations of the universe. We all have an equal entitlement to individuality. But, but we don't, often we don't really truly value our individuality. So where, where does our individuality come from? Where, how do we value our individuality and what is it? It, it is a total recognition of our self-worth and self-value. The recognition that we are a human, unique creation of the universe. We are, we are different, we're entitled to be different. Um, but what happens is we lose our individuality because of the way we've been brought up in our homes and because of the way we've been brought up in, in society, in school, from a very early age. We've been, we've been taught to conform, we've been, we've been wearing school uniforms, we've been standing in lines, we call people on the phone, they ask for our reference number, our telephone number. Nobody's asking for your name, they're asking for a number, you know, that kind of thing. Mm. Um, the important thing is, is to really and truly recognize our self-worth and self-value. This is our individuality. This is at the heart of our individuality. And when we start to do that, we start to, we, what we start to do is we start to, um, we start to respect ourselves and we start to become more truthful to ourselves. Um, and, and, and it gives us a sense of dignity, basically. Um, so that's the importance of, the, of, of individuality. And once we start to recognize our individuality, we move on to the next chapter, which is love. And love in, in, in the next chapter is more not about romantic love, although it also is romantic love, it touches on that. It's more about self-love, um, because it, this is really what consistent with the theme of the book. Right? It's about ourselves, our inner world, our, our, our engagement with the world, engage with ourselves first and then we engage with the world. So. The thing is, this is a lot of people go around and they say, I can't find love, I want love, I can't find it anywhere, and you know, this kind of thing, right? Yeah. Um, but the thing is that love starts with ourselves. We don't have to go and find it, it's already in us. It starts with the recognition of our self worth and, 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 and our self value and our, and, our, and our individuality. That's what happens. Um, then what happens is we start to feel self love, we start to feel value. And this is really, really important for us, is to feel valued and, tell, and loved. And I wrote in my book, um, there's a sort of short passage and it goes like this, after all the years of searching and yearning, I found love. I found it in me, I found it for me, and it always been me. And we've got love inside us, we just don't, we're always looking outside ourselves for love, you know. Um, looking outside ourselves for love, and we're looking outside our lives for acceptance. That's what we're looking for. The most important thing is not what other people think of us, it's what we think of ourselves. Now the question is this, is what is self-love? What is, what is it, how do we define it? Self-love is the unconditioned acceptance of ourselves. That is what self-love is. We, we unconditionally accept ourselves. That is self-love. And that's the most important, primary, and best love of all. That is it. You've got that love, and you can move on. You can move on. Because you'll be resonating love. And when you resonate love, you've got these vibes happening, these vibrations of love going out, you will attract love into your life. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, that, that's fantastic. A girlfriend of mine, actually, uh, Tracy Corman, who I've interviewed on Truth Expose TV before, she always says to me, 
the love you are seeking is inside of you. That's what she always says to me. So all that love that you have for others, it's all there for you as well. Uh, and I, I love your your analogy of that, uh, that, that unconditional love for self. Uh, that's really a beautiful thing and it's something that I think a lot of people are not conscious of because, you know, particularly in Australia, you know, we've, we've got the glass ceiling here and we've got tall poppy syndrome and, you know, you'd be knocked growing up if you said you loved yourself. You know, if you admittedly say to people, I love myself, they'd say, well, who do you think you are? You're up yourself, all that sort of thing. So people actually get mocked for this if they, you know, have too big an ego or, you know, not in America, of course, America, they're much more accepting of people who, uh, who step up and step out and, and who claim their truth and speak up. Um, however, in Australia, I think uh, it's kind of frowned upon, you know, and it's almost like you have to go against the system a little bit to actually to say, hey, it's okay. It's okay to love yourself and you are beautiful and you are amazing and, uh, you know, anything is possible for you and just to, just to, I guess, tap into that. So, so how would you, you know, how, how would you tap into that love? Or how, how do you unconditionally love yourself? Uh, well, as I say, it starts with with, with, with self-respect, self-value, really valuing yourself. All when you are a unique creation of the universe. There is no other old one. There's only one. One special, unique old one in this world. Now, so there you are. You're unique. You're unique. Recognize your uniqueness. Recognize your self-value, your self-worth. And then you're really, that's already an act of self-love. Mm -hmm. But then I say this, as I said before, is you need to unconditionally accept yourself. You don't, you don't, you know, you're not concerned really with what other people think of you, mm -hmm. but really what you think of yourself. And it's a, it's a major shift in, in a, a major paradigm shift in people. So it really and truly is. But it's just so, so, so important. Um, and then, then what happens is, is individually, individuality feeds up the self-love, and the love, self-love feeds up the individuality. And it's a real growth process. And you feel, you feel beautiful. You feel loved. You feel, you feel that we don't, you don't need to be going out and yearning for external love, because we've got all of this internal love. We've got the best love of all is self-love, is our own love, love for ourselves, unconditional acceptance of ourselves. Where else are we going to get that? It's going yeah. to be really, it's really hard to find that, isn't it? Yes, yes. Well, our parents would often, you know, give us that kind of love. <laughs> our parents generally, most parents. Uh, yeah, well, I think that, that's right. I think that's kind of like a maternal, paternal love. But I think it's you know, talking about, and yeah, I suppose our kids too, you know, but, but children. Um, but generally speaking, um, there are lots of people who are single. There are lots of people who are in relationships um, and the relationships aren't quite perfect. Um, and, then you, and then the question arises, well, how should these, how can we fix these relationships? What is, what is the answer to that? Well, the same thing is, is loving somebody's unconditional acceptance of them. He's not trying to try, trying to take control of them. Accept them for who they are. And then what happens is relationships are far more steady and, and consistent and, and peaceful and stuff like that. Um, and if that isn't happening in a relationship where there's this, 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 this tug of war, this battle of, you know, to see who's you know, kind of in control and trying to take control, well, that's not a good thing. A relationship is are two individuals coming together to form a companionship, um, but at the same time preserving and promoting their individuality. That's what I believe it is. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I love that. And, uh, you know, I often, I often joke, although it's true, uh, that we are actually one in a billion, roughly. Like, uh, when we're born, we've been between 400 million to 1.2 billion swimmers to get to the finish line. Uh, so we are actually about one in a billion just by being born. And uh, it's, it's amazing. You, you know, you often don't think about that on the micro level. Um, however, you know, just by being born, very extraordinary and so it's, it's a matter of getting that uh, that we are very special everyone is very unique and individual and embracing that and you know celebrating that and making the most of 
of our time on this planet because I think the older you get, you realise you know, how short it is. You know, I've had uh, two friends personally kill themselves in the last uh, 15 years and I've had people around me have had depression. I've had depression. Uh, and the fact that people actually kill themselves, and this is a you know growing epidemic uh, in, in Western countries particularly, uh, is very, very sad. You know, that people actually want to end their amazing lives and they don't, they don't get how amazing they are and, and they let these negative thoughts get them down and, and you know, worst case scenario, they kill themselves. Best case scenario, they you know, make the most of life and really embrace all that life has to offer, which is part of what we're talking about here. So uh, that's fantastic. So any more to say on that uh, point there, Kai? Well, I think that just to, to follow from what you said, I think that people who, who, who do suffer from depression, some of it is genetic, some of it you can't be really about, some of it is very severe. Are there different levels of, 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 of depression and types of depression? Um, but I think that people often get depressed when they're trying to live up to a standard that, that doesn't work for them. They're trying to be something they're not. Um, instead of just accepting this is me, this is, I accept myself, um, I'm the most important person in my life and that is it. Whether my family accept me or not or my friends accept me or not, it's not, it's not, it's not the most important thing. What is most important is that I'm... Now I think this is where depression and suicide comes in. Is that, and I'm kind of come to another chapter on context. Things that that affect us in our lives, we think they're much greater than what they are. And but when you look at it in the context of your whole life, it's actually not that bad. So we live long lives, uh, and, and we, you know, we pass through this period. This period. So what I'll do now is I'm going to move on to the next chapter, um, which is belief and faith. And our belief and faith is about um, what we, what we've got is this basic need. We're born into a world where we are, we literally come up, we have experience where we accumulate doubt. We accumulate doubt and, 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 and doubt holds us back. So, because of the experiences we've had and because of what we've been told and taught, we have doubts. And, and, and doubt, we fear because of doubt. This is what causes fear because we fear the outcome. We fear the outcome because we've got doubt. And this is a terrible, terrible, terrible infection. And holds us back. It holds us back from progressing our lives. It holds us back from it, it, it can lose our courage. It can lose our self trust, our self guidance. It can lose all of those things. It holds us back. So doubt and faith, sorry, doubt and belief cannot exist together. So what is belief? Belief is knowing that you're going to have something. Right. Doubt is, well, doubting you're not going to have it, thinking you're not going to have it. Belief is the opposite of doubt. The two can't exist together. You can't have doubt and belief together. So one has to dominate, and that has to be belief. You have to know that you're going to have something. And then what happens is your vibrations change. The law of attraction changes, starts to work for you. Then what happens is you move with a stronger version of it. It progresses, it progresses to what is called faith, right? To the belief is knowing we're going to have something, faith is already having it. Now, if you already have it, and you can visualize it and convince, convince yourself you already have it, then this is the law of attraction working at its highest, highest possible level. There is no higher level. The law of attraction will not work at a higher level than that, and if you already have something. So, the most important thing is to is to not doubt, is to what be very wary of doubt. We need to eliminate doubt from our lives. And the way we eliminate it, we go back to positive things. To positive thoughts. And this is how we eliminate doubt. And we move, and when we experience the benefits of positive things, we take risks. Let's accept this, you have to take risks. If you're going to do this, you have to take risks. But when you see the benefits of positive things, then the process of belief begins to grow and you start to believe in belief. Then you move to faith. Then you move to the place of from knowing to having, basically. So this is really what it's all about. 
So that's really what, what, what that chapter is all about. You just read the description of that chapter. Okay, so now I'm going to move on to the next. Is that okay? Do you want to say anything? Yeah, that's fantastic. I'm loving, I'm loving your uh, principles. I think they're awesome. So, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay, should I continue? Yes, yes. Okay. The next one is, um, is acceptance, context, and forgiveness. Now, what often happens to us is we get into situations, people, call, people cause us anger, resentment, they offend us, all that type of thing. Um, it, can be, it can be a personal thing, it can be a physical thing, it can be a car accident that makes you angry, you have a fallout with a friend or family member, you have a, um, a running with a business associate, and this type of thing. And these things affect, affect us, affect us emotionally. So what we need to do first, is what, this, what we need to really do is accept that these things have happened. There's nothing you can do to change them. And if somebody drives into your car and you have an accident, there's not much you can do about it. If somebody offends you, there's not much you can do about it. It's done, they've offended you already. So what we first do is we accept it. So okay, if this has happened, I accept it. Then we move on from acceptance to context. Right? When we accept something, we still could be angry. We still could be angry and resentful. We can accept it. So okay, it's happened, I accept it. But to improve our state of mind, we then move on to context. We say to ourselves, we sit back and we say to ourselves, in the context of my whole life, how is this incident going to affect me? If I look back on my life from the end, how is this incident in the context of my whole life? When I'm on my deathbed, am I going to be thinking about this? Basically. So we look at context as a whole. And when we look at context, we realize the things that are, that, are, that are upsetting us are not really that important in the context of the whole life. And this extends to how we relate to people and how we interact with people on an everyday basis. Um, is a lot of the time, we, 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 we respond with our egos. Now, our egos are there to protect, to protect our subconscious, right? So when we get injured emotionally, um, our egos kick in to protect our subconscious. But in all these Eastern philosophies, the ego is referred to as the false self. It's not, it's not real, it's not true. Because at the end of the day, you're not in hospital with cuts and bruises, you aren't lying there with our arms and legs and plaster. You're fine at the end of the day. It's just an emotional, alert emotion. So what happens is, you look at context and say, how does this affect my life as a whole? If I look back at the end of my life, how, how will it have affected me? Fine, that's what you do. And then you move and start thinking more rationally. You start saying, this is not so serious. This is not the end of the world. And another thing comes into play also is, is sometimes in our lives, we find we have negative experiences. And this goes back to the whole concept of third two. Is, is we have these negative experiences and we think, Immediately we think they're negative, and this is what affects our subconscious. But often we find later, and it could even be two, three, four years later, we found out that it actually was a positive experience and we're better off than before. And you often see this in um, breakup in relationships, um, changes of, let's say, loss of, uh, of, 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 um, of, of employment or something like that. People lose their employment, they lose their jobs. And this is the most terrible thing, and then they land up in a much greater position. They may start their own businesses, whatever it is, or a person that has a relationship pulled out, find the most beautiful partner in the world. But they go through the street for years, basically. But what we need to do is we need to look at negative experiences as an opportunity for growth, uh, and difficulty and obstacles in our lives as an opportunity for growth, because these things test us. They're there to test us and to help us grow into better and stronger people. Negative experiences as an opportunity, not only for, not only as an opportunity to grow, but a positive in the making. Because this could be a positive in the making. And often, I don't know if it's happened to you. It's like you feel that you experience something negative and then further down the road, it could be an hour later or a few years later, because you find out, hold on, this is good, this is good that that happened. But then we move from 
we move away from context, right? So context is just a sense of perspective. Down on, basically. But we go beyond that. We go to what's what we call forgiveness. We still might carry some resentment and anger. So what we do is we forgive the thing or the person that has caused us resentment. So I'm not saying we walk away from it, right? I'm just saying we forgive, we forgive these people. If we don't forgive them, we're inviting these people into our lives. We don't want these people in our lives because they're causing us discomfort. But by not forgiving and by carrying anger and resentment around, we are inviting them into our lives. We're making them actually part of our lives. We spend time thinking about them and we think about what we're going to do about it and all that kind of thing. So what we do is we detach ourselves of forgiving. We forgive, us, we forgive these people or whatever it is that's called us discomfort and we can then think more rationally. We can then think, make decisions more rationally and it doesn't affect our positive disposition. That's really important. Yeah, so that's I, that chapter. I think that's fantastic. And you know, I heard uh, at a course where the head of education in Sydney actually Sorry, course, uh, he, he said actually also if you can if you can go from forgiveness to actually uh, appreciation if you can come to that point of uh, not just not just forgiving because forgiving sometimes people can still make that person wrong so by appreciating the gifts that have come from whatever hardship has happened um, then that uh, that is a very powerful way to be so if you can uh, actually get to appreciation as well uh, as forgiveness, I think forgiveness is part of it as well, uh, and actually look for the gifts in it, then that, that is really powerful. Uh, a, a, an example I can give from my own life is back in 2002, I went to rent a place in Main Beach, and the first two years I lived on the Gold Coast, I was looking to rent to America. I just wanted somewhere to rent, and I gave this guy bond money, rent money. It uh, turns out that he was actually renting, he was three weeks behind in his rent, he did a runner, basically left town with, with my thousand odd dollars and I was so devastated at the time. I, I literally, I, I think I cried for a week at that point. I was working as a, a journalist at the Gold Coast Sun and I just couldn't believe I, that I did that. Even though I had the guys in San Lee, I still remember, uh, I had his mobile number, I had a receipt from him uh, and looking back, you know, at the time I absolutely devastated, couldn't tell anyone about it. However, then I made a decision. I just sort of decided then that I was going to buy my own place. And so from there, I actually bought the property that I now live in in Southport. And uh, it was actually a blessing in disguise. And now I often think back to that. He was a young surfy dude. He was probably about 20, 22. I had a young girlfriend who was pregnant. And I thought, well, you know, maybe he just needed a thousand dollars more than I did uh, back then. And, uh, you know, now I've, I've, <laughs> I've come to the point of appreciating uh, what happened then. However, at the time, uh, I was so entrenched and so devastated by, by what had happened. Uh, and I think beating myself up more so that I actually fell for the trap. Because, you know, really I got ripped off. And a lot of people do get ripped off. And, however, you know, I do also believe in karma. And I think if people go around doing that sort of thing, they've got to live with their own decisions. And I do believe that, you know, what comes around goes around. And that guy was probably a very, uh, not a very happy man in his life, you know. And, and you know, if you're going to go and do those sorts of things to people, then it will come back in one form or another, and the karma will come back. And, and you know, if you put out negative energy and negative vibes like that, it will come back in one way or another. Uh, you know, however, I you know, I just I just hope that he's you know found his way and that he's happy and you know that he's seen through all his things. However, you know, it's just something to to be aware of and to notice. So, so now many years later, I look at that experience and I actually thank. Thank that guy Lee for doing that because otherwise I would probably you know, still be renting and living in the place so I find now. And of course, if I sold it, I'd make more than a thousand dollars. So you know, financially, it was a good choice to actually invest in the property. But that's just a little story from my life, and I'm sure we all, you know, everyone watching this, I'm sure you have examples of stories where, you know, at, in the moment when you felt the upset when something didn't quite go the way you expected, because uh, life does throw curveballs all the time, right? So in the moment when something doesn't go the way you expect, it can be hard sometimes to see the gift that comes from that experience. However, you know, these challenges that, that have come our way, I always say that uh, there's no challenge too big that you can't handle it. So just a little point on that. So 
uh, very good. I, I really appreciate what you say about uh, forgiveness and about letting go and, and not holding on to that resentment because it is like taking poison and actually, you know, if you want someone else dead, but you're actually taking the poison. So there's, there's no point in that. It takes away too much, too much energy. No, absolutely. I think that the only thing all you're doing really is hurting yourself. Um, you know, you're not going to get any benefit from it really. Um, so I think if you look at it logically, it's the right, the right approach. But it's, it's, it's an opportunity for growth, and this is what this is, my book is about. Is managing through those situations. And it's happened. What could you do, Paul? When it happened, and um, there's nothing you could do about it. You couldn't find that guy, so you had to accept it. Yeah. Um, ultimately, now we're talking. You look at it the context in the context of your whole life. It's not a big issue. Um, and as you just said to me, you've forgiven the guy. And you appreciate the experience because, because it's enriched in some way. Um, and that's a good thing. And I think that's what, what we, we, should, we should look at these experiences as an opportunity for growth, as a challenge. Um, and, and all these experiences, the people to negative experiences, obstacles that are thrown out or thrown away, whatever it is, um, are opportunities for growth. They equip us for a better life for us, and, and they equip us to be better people. Um, the Eastern philosophies say that um, the universe is always evolving, it's always changing its nature, it's working to make itself better. So it's sometimes, we, and, and we are reflections of the universe. We are, we, we are basically children of the universe. Um, what is available to the universe is available to us, basically. So the universe is always evolving and, 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 and improving itself, so are we. Um, and that's how we would have, we have this overall view of it. So, Overall, we're improving. We're improving all the time. We're gaining this experience. We're gaining this knowledge, and we're becoming better people. Um, and that's what we really do. That's the view we should adopt. Yeah, that constant, makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. We're constantly expanding and learning. It's not like you have a, a rich place where everything is just working like clockwork. You know, I think there's always expansion and growth in any moment. And the minute you think that you've learned it all and you know it all, uh, is the minute you stop growing. And evolving as a person. Correct. So you do. You just stagnate at that point. Um, I want to go into the next um, yes, yes, chapter. Uh, the next chapter is equality, humility, and, and modesty. And um, this chapter really covers directed at the equality of people. Is that we are all born fundamentally or broadly speaking, we're all born people, uh, and we. Everybody is entitled, everybody is equal to everybody else. Nobody is more equal than another person. Nobody is more important than another person. You're not less important or more important than another person. And you're entitled to your equality. As, 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 as birth, you're entitled to equality. We all have people that we look up to, we may look up to, and we may have people we aspire to because of their aspirations, and their attributes, or some achievements, or something like that. And, and we look at this and we think, oh, this person is great. But those are attributes that does not define a person. You can have those people, but at the same time, they at home, maybe they're terrible to their children, or they don't treat their wives well, or their partners well, or they just don't treat people well generally, or they're insincere, or something like that. So these attributes, we look at and we see them. There are all these role models on TV, pop stars, movie stars, politicians, whatever they are, and we look at them and we, and we put them on a pedestal. But we are equal to them. Yeah, these are just people. We are just people. They are just people. And we are all equal, basically. And really what we want is what we want to do to make our own lives better and other parts of people's lives better is to treat them with equality. So we treat people the way we would like to be treated. And that's the whole concept of equality basically a summary. But then we move on to modesty, basically. So modesty is not continually boasting about your achievements or, or, or speaking about your achievements or you often, I don't know if it happens to you, but often you sit with people and it's one way of traffic and you just sit there and listen to, to everything they've achieved and everything they're doing and everything what they're going to do and, and all of this kind. And that is, that is a lack of humility. Um, Humility is, is if you've achieved something, um, 
It really and truly is from our own perspective as people taking quality into account. It is or effort that's linked us to effort that's that's, that's linked us to abundance, basically. That's what what our achievements are there for. That's to say we've achieved this because we put in effort that linked us to abundance. We shouldn't use it to belittle people. We can use it to encourage people and inspire people to different things. But we use it to belittle people and to elevate ourselves above people, that isn't a good thing. It's not a good thing. We shouldn't we shouldn't set ourselves above other people. And beyond that, it goes like there's, there's another element to it. People try and reach beyond their grasp. The other people around can do something better than they can do it, but because of their egos or something else, they want they want to do it. Right? This is a lack of humility. So I'll go and do it and 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 leave me alone, I'll go and do it. There's somebody over here that can do it just as easy. So you know very easily, much easier than you can, much less effort, much more experience and knowledge of it. So there's another element here. But in another on another level, on a more eastern level, on a philosophical level, Humility is, not, is giving a person an opportunity to be more. He's not judging a person. He's saying, I have, I have become more, I can become more, they can become more. And that is more of an Eastern view of it, or the ancient Eastern view of it. It's, it's not what people are, it's what people can become. So we don't judge people on what they've done or what they are doing. We judge them, we, we rather give them latitude and we give them. A, you have a broader view of it, you say, it doesn't matter what this person is now, right? You can rather focus on this person and think of this person as how this person can be, um, not what they are. Because I have become more, they can become more. And I'm a perfect, perfect example of it. I mean, I was really an arrogant and aggressive with this person. Seriously, I didn't take it. It was not going to happen. Uh, all that was important to me was money and much more. You asked me what my hobbies were. I'd say money and much more. And there were no prisoners who wasn't interested in it. But that's not the case anymore. So I don't want to do that. I don't want to live like that. So that's an example of that. Um, let me move on to modesty. Modesty in the context of this book is not continually troubling your friends and family with your problems. Not continually being a burden to your family and friends. Understanding that relations have to have a sense of equality. If they have a sense of equality, that there's a give and take, a decent degree of give and take, an equilibrium in these relationships, they have greater, greater quality, equality. That's the whole idea of modesty. It's not, it's not leaning on people, basically. It's trying to deal with your own problems. Yes, you, you can go and seek advice and guidance and stuff like that. But I know from experience, you get some people, they'll ring you up five times a day with their problems. And you, you, you can only really is a listener. No, you, don't, you don't even have a chance to speak. Um, and and they, it's almost like, look, why don't you go and see a psychologist or something? You know, that, that's what they do. Um, but it's it's kind of like, you get this type of thing. So, between relationships have to be well balanced. You know, and we can't, and it's not right for us to be on other people because it causes them discomfort. Now, we don't want to be discomforted, so we should be more we should be called other people. That's that chapter. Okay, does that make sense? Yes, that makes a lot of sense. And you know, and while you know friends do share things with each other, it's important to recognise if you're being a burden to your friend and if you're you know you're really carrying on about something. I mean, the thing is, is you know, like I say, life throws curveballs all the time. We're all challenged by things on a daily basis, no doubt. And it's a matter of how long you're going to hold on to, you know, resentment, anger, frustration. Now, or are you going to look for, okay, how can you work around this? How can you make the best of the situation and move through it? Whereas some people just choose to hang on to their traumas for, for months at a time sometimes and, you know, hang on to being right about something uh, instead of, you know, going with the flow of the universe and whatever's, you know, whatever's being presented and, and look for the lessons in everything. There's always lessons in everything and no challenge to you that you can't handle. That's my belief. So, uh, yes, yeah, so I think that's uh, a very good point to that. Don't burden other people. Stuff going on, and you know, I think it's fine to share. You know, share what's going on for you. However, just recognise when you're, you know, really holding on to something that perhaps you can let go of, or perhaps see at things in a different way. If you're challenged by something. I think so. I think, I think that's right. That's exactly right. I mean, 
when you're you holding on to these things, you dump on your friends and family, and it's an ongoing thing, as you say, you hold on to it for a time for age. And, and people, there's tedious for people. Yeah. Um, and, and, it's, and I don't think it's our intention with our friends and family to make to make our relationships and our experience with them a tedious experience for them, or this or uncomfortable experience. What they want from us and what we want from them is a comfortable, enjoyable, rewarding experience. Um, so I think you're absolutely spot on. Um, so I think it's right. And so what I'll do is I'll, I'll move on to the next. Yes. The ninth uh, uh, chapter, which is commitment, and this is very, very, very cool. This is really, in a way, um, it's the beginning, the start, and the end, basically. This is something that should really be right. what's at the heart of this book, really, and it's called it's about commitment. Right. Um, and I said that earlier, uh, the most important person in our lives is, our, oh, is ourselves, or ourselves. Um, we spend 24 hours a day with ourselves. Nobody spends more time with us. It's the relationship with ourselves that is the most related, important relationship. This is the most important relationship. But what do we do? We go out there, we have commitments. We have work commitments, social commitments, um, family commitments. We've got, we join groups, community groups. We go for to gym, yoga classes, cooking classes, all of these things we do. Um, and we do these things methodically, systematically, and professionally. Most of them in here. We take them seriously. But when it comes to ourselves, we don't. So what people do is they think, okay, um, I'll, go on a, I'll go on a course, I'll read a book, improving myself. But I think we all know that people can read a book, or you can go on a course or a seminar, and not, it's not, doesn't it's between, a week and it takes a month basically and it all faded away and you come back for more really week for basically. So what people do is they look for this external stuff, but they don't really establish it within. Um, they go in and they're hoping to buy a solution. I'm gonna buy a solution in the form of a book, a seminar, it could be a podcast, a blog, whatever it is. I'm gonna get the solution, but there are no solutions. We have to work on ourselves. But we don't work on ourselves. Despite this important relationship we have with ourselves, we don't have a methodical, systematic, systematic approach to improving our own lives. We don't sit down with pen and paper and say, I've got this problem, right? How am I going to do you write down the problem and analyze the problem? Or if you've got a certain emotion, or well, you're feeling sad, or you're feeling there's something that's happening in your life, or you analyze it and you say to yourself, How am I feeling? Why am I feeling like this and how am I going to fix it? Use pen and paper, you know, that kind of thing. And if you've got a decision to make, um, what are the advantages? What are the disadvantages? What are the interesting points? You're really putting time into yourself. And when you put time into yourself, you are, it's an expression of the individuality and self value. It's an expression that you, it's a reflection that you love yourself, you respect yourself and your individuality. And the more you conduct yourself in this manner, the more self-love and individuality. The more you are concrete, the more you're giving such to the place. And this is what people don't do. So this is very, very, very important. So you can take a book like mine, which I'm over here, there's a pocket book. You can take, sorry, here, this is the front cover. Take a book like mine, draw, and this is a, it's a 60 minutes, specifically written, so it's a 60 minute read, so people can read it over and over a day. And it's only by repetition that you really get the message. The message that, you, that starts to impact on your subconscious. I know if you go to a, a, a seminar, read a book, it's not going to change you. It doesn't, it doesn't have, there's no traction, it's not going to have a lasting change. I wrote my book so it is as easy and timeless as possible to read. So people can read it over and over and over again, basically. So, this is the whole idea is rather have one good book, right? Have one good book or go to one good seminar and then really put time into it. So this, I really believe in that and I'm going to really put time into it. I'm going to go home, I'm going to make notes and I'm going to define myself. I'm going to have a full system of beliefs and I'm going to live by and this is it. And I'm going to really and truly work on it. We don't work on ourselves. We don't. We work on everything else. 
I mean, you do too. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm sure I'm not pointing fingers, right? But you're very with a great career. Um, but I don't know. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not pressing you. I don't know how much time you actually put into yourself. And, 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 and the manner in which you put into yourself. So professionally, schematically, I mean, I've met you, I know you. You're absolutely professional, you're absolutely methodical, absolutely systematic, fantastic. But a lot of us are, but, and a lot of people are, but we don't apply those same, the, the same approach to ourselves, basically. And, and that's a real big doubt. Um, and we don't get the most out of our lives, we don't get the most out of ourselves. So what we're doing is, we're living in the subconscious environment, we're living from our memory, memory bank, and we're just going through the motions really. And we're not really looking into ourselves and getting the most out of our life. What happens is, you know, if you strip away all the, if you strip away all your possessions, all your connections, all your associations, everything like that, and then you are there, right? So you can see yourself as you stop and you can see the right? Then you detach yourself from the world. Then you can say, this is who I really am. And you strip all that stuff away. And you, then, then you are in, 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 in bed, basically. There to be seen. And you can disengage with the world and you can say, who am I really? Who, are, who really am I? And what do I want to do? And this is an act of, 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 of growth of individuality, growth of self worth, growth of self belief, growth of self love. And that's very, very important. So, commitment to ourselves, I believe, is the most important commitment. It really is the most important commitment to our, in our lives. Ourselves, once we committed to ourselves and made ourselves better, we're capable of anything. Mm. And that's what I think we, we, we call, we come up short, but everybody does. It's not, you know, just everybody does, does that. That's really, really important. Commitment is very, very important. But it's not important today and tomorrow. Commitment is, is a commitment to the end. If you decide to get into it, you stay with it to the very, very end. You know, it's like this marital vow you take. I'll be this forever, basically. But it's a vow we need to take with ourselves. It's, we take, make a commitment. We make a commitment to commit to ourselves. We're in it forever. We don't get in and out of it. It's not we can't be half in and half out. We be completely in it. And because we are, because we should be taking it professionally. We should be taking it seriously. We should be taking this relationship very, very seriously. Because this is, is at the heart of our lives, our, our own experience. This is going to, our relationship with ourselves will dictate the quality of our whole life from now to the end. That's true. No one knows us better than ourselves. You know, we're there with ourselves from the beginning and we're there with ourselves at the end. And it really is important, as you say, to really get to know ourselves, love ourselves, nurture ourselves. And you, know, you question me about how much time. I spend with myself. <laughs> I actually, I, I do have a lot of sentiments. I have a sponge of knowledge. And I also, the last few years, I've been ensuring that I make time for me as well in amongst that. I've just spent a month on the road traveling, uh, doing different programs, and taking time out for me. And uh, it's, it's been fantastic. I'm, I'm, I invest in myself in my, my travel adventures. I go to the beach, I get massages, I do meditation, I do yoga. Uh, so they're, they're ways that I uh, take time out for me. I love saunas and spas. Uh, so those little indulgences and, and they really uh, enjoying the, um, the pleasures of, of all those sorts of things is, is great just to, to, uh, to nurture and honour and love yourself and look after yourself and really think about the wheel of life, uh, the wheel of life and all the different areas of life and making sure that you have as much as possible uh, areas of business, finances, family, health, uh, adventure, you know, spirituality, etc. All those different areas of life, making sure that you, you know, check in with yourself and, and rate yourself out of 10 in each of those areas and see how you're going on, on the wheel of life balance. And, you know, most people's wheels are pretty, um, uh, are pretty shaky. <laughs> you know, they're oh, yeah, not necessarily yeah. smooth wheels. And I guess that's the thing is, you know, consistently, you know, working at that that and just and checking in with yourself as to as to how the balance of life is going you know, and mm -hmm. the relationship with self. I know we've, we've um, 
got over an hour so far. Have we, we haven't covered the 10th principle, so maybe we need to cover that quickly and then we'll, we'll wrap up. Okay, let me do that really quickly. Sorry, I'll be speaking too much. Um, okay. The 10th principle basically is our inner home. So it's, 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 it's all the, the previous nine principles of amalgamating the nine to become one thing, our inner home. And it's from this home, our inner home, that we engage with the world, basically. So this is what we base, this is what our inner home is. And our inner home gives us emotional benefits and it gives us behavioral benefits. The emotional benefits are um, we feel more self confident, with a greater sense of self belief, a greater sense of self trust, um, a greater sense of contentment. Um, and a whole heap of other emotions that come with it. The behavioral benefits are, are responses to things that happen in your life. So if you feel without, then abundance comes to mind. You know that there is abundance and I can have it. Um, if you feel not loved, you know that you love yourself and that's the most important part of it. If you feel, if you, if you feel or say something negative or do something negative, you know the vibrations of that negative and you're a and these are the types of, I'm not going to go through all of them because we don't have any time, but those are the types of behavioral benefits that when, and, 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 because all of the, all these principles unite and amalgamate to become one thing I would do. And it changes our subconscious. But it doesn't happen on its own. You have to read this book quite a few times, um, however many times it takes, and, and, and it will start to transform your life. We'll do that. It's done for other people, and it's done it for me. But then we say to ourselves, okay, how do we need a technique to awaken and ignite all of these principles together? So what we use is the, the, the concept and principle of auto-suggestion. So we use two words that ignite and awaken all of these principles. We can say two words to ourselves, and all of those nine principles awaken and ignite together. And those two words are go home. So when we say go home, Think of all of those nine principles. All of those nine principles come to mind. So that's how we use it. And it works like that. If you think of going to shopping, you think of going to a supermarket. If you think of going to put petrol in your car, you think of the service station, the gas station. Um, and it's the same. It's the same basic thesis. It's a cut. It's, it's a thesis of auto suggestion. And when you say go home, the same thing applies. But it applies any experience you have. That will be established in your subconscious will be established by two, two ways. One is by frequency of the experience, and number two is by impact of the experience. This is what really and truly impacts on our subconscious. So you have to nothing will we'll gain nothing on it, nothing will do anything for us. We have to make an effort for abundance. And I'm finished. That's all I want to say. Oh, that's fantastic. And you have an ebook audio and hard copy books available. From all the W's dot total me dot world. We've been chatting with Kai Chen and his book was Total Me Discover Contentment and Stability in 60 Minutes and covering all the 10 principles in that book, which needs to be read again and again and again. And we do need to go home soon. Uh, however, any final words, uh, Kai, before we wrap up? Oh, I'd like to thank you for spending time with me today and, um, and I hope that, that anyone who watches this benefits from it. And certainly anyone who reads the book or listens to it certainly benefits from it does have value. And um, yeah, I just wish you well and I look forward to catching up again. Thank you so much, Kai. And now with the book, it is a, a digital book, but it's available on a voluntary payment system. So basically the idea is that you first absorb the content and pay depending on the value that you receive from the product. I'm sure whoever was watching this will receive a lot of value from that. So check it out, totalme.world. Thank you very much, Kai Cheng, and you can connect with me or today on all my social media channels. You'll find me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Plus, Instagram, and Pinterest, and of course the YouTube channel, Walter Alton Alton Make sure you subscribe if you haven't. Uh, I'd love to hear your feedback, comments, any questions you might have. So wherever you're watching this video right now, please pop any comments or feedback or questions underneath the video. And love to hear from you. Thank you so much for joining us wherever you are in the world. Thank you, Kai. And hopefully you've had a lot of value from this interview. I know I certainly have. It's been a fantastic reality check and, and some great tips on, on how to go home and uh, and to 
to become a total you, total me, and discover contentment and stability in your life, which is so important. So thanks once again, Kai. Thank you for watching. And uh, please share the love if you've enjoyed what you've seen. Share the uh, your, uh, your friends and family. And we'll create a better, more peaceful world uh, overall. Thanks so much once again, and we'll be back to you soon with more episodes of Truth Expose TV. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks, Alden. Take care. Thanks. Bye.